Once upon a time, the art of the movies was to suspend belief. Today, the art is to create belief. One of the greatest challenges in the modern cinema was to make you believe that a man could fly. They succeeded in a film called Superman. Hello, I'm Christopher Reeve. You know, I was thinking the other day about some of the strange parts that I've played since I started acting as a kid. One time I was the third guard from the left in Cinderella. Another time I played a tree. In Shakespeare's and Winter's Tale, I played a bear, as well as lords, officers, attendants, etc. And usually I was the etc. Uh, another time I was a Nazi. <laughs> and once I had the privilege of being Catherine Hepburn's only grandson. Well, it was on Broadway anyway. But I think that if somebody had ever told me that one day I would dye my hair black and wear red boots and play a man who flies around and lives by the North Pole, I would have had to say, um, okay, that could be fun. And it was, playing Superman. You know, since the film opened, a lot of people have written in saying, how did you do it? Well, I don't think we should show you everything. You know, I think we should keep a few secrets. But let's go together right now. Let's go back to the beginning of filming, 1977, and let's take a look at how they make a film the size of Superman. And we can meet Marlon Brando and uh, Gene Hackman, Ned Beatty, Valerie Perrine, Margot Kidder, and a lot of the actors and technicians who made the film. You know, Superman's been around for a long time. And the kids who read him in the 30s are nearing retirement age now. But for reasons that aren't very hard to imagine, children have always had a fascination with this character. So I think the thing to do is to start by checking in with the kids of today. Let's see what they think about Superman. Walks into a telephone booth Black and... Superman. It must have like a, hang, a coat hanger or a closet where you can put his costumes and then change. Well, he came from... See, Jupiter? Um, when he's wearing his reporter suit, he might have his Superman suit being washed. He tries to take all the crime out of Earth. I mean, it's the only planet he knows now since Krypton's blown, blown up. He flies and he saves people. When Marlon Brando stepped on the sea stage at Shepperton Studios, England, it was a momentous occasion in the history of motion pictures for it marked the beginning of filming one of America's greatest comic strip heroes, Superman. Brando plays Jor-El, the chief scientist of Krypton who predicted the planet was doomed. Susanna York portrays his wife, Lara. They are the parents of the infant Kal-El, who is later to grow up to become Superman. Under the direction of Richard Donner, they presided over the last days of the doomed planet Krypton. The story was to be recreated in epic proportions over the long shooting period. The plains of Canada served as the great wheat fields of Kansas, where the infant Clark was raised under the care of Ma and Pa Kent. In Pinewood Studios, England, the Daily Planet set has been built in perfect detail. Tons of office equipment is brought in from the United States. The smallest details were used to recreate the frantic and disorganized atmosphere of a modern American newsroom. Mild-mannered Clark Kent became a reporter at the Daily Planet, where he met its traditional occupants, ambitious reporter Lois Lane, the editor Perry White, and young photographer Jimmy Olsen. In the streets of New York, for some high-flying scenes and the exteriors of the Daily Planet. In the foothills of the Rockies, where Superman's archenemy and foe, Lex Luthor, aided, abetted, and annoyed by the clumsy Otis and the luscious Miss Teshmacher, attempts an audacious missile hijack. Back in Pinewood Studios again, to an extraordinary set. The cavern of Lex Luthor, nestled under Metropolitan Grand Central Station, he spares nothing for his own comfort, living in the lap of luxury. In the confines of these studio walls, 
Arctic wastes seem to stretch far into the horizon. Styrofoam ice floats on water in a tank holding 800,000 gallons of water. Tons of salt were needed to give the impression of snow-swept plains. This caused many problems because of the corrosive effect the salt had on everything. One speck of it could ruin a camera worth thousands of dollars. Technicians had to wear rubber boots as the salt was eating through their leather soles. Carefully placed lamps, dry ice, and smoke were all assembled to create a mystical backdrop to a magical story. Superman, the fictional character who, along with Sherlock Holmes and Tarzan, rank as the three most famous men who never actually existed. Maniac. Do you really think you could hide it from me by encasing it in lead? Cut! The story was told to us in 1938. In comic books first, but has been told again and again in cartoons, in books, on radio, on records, in film serials, and on television. It was a bold and risky venture to attempt to put him in a full-length feature film. The idea was the brainchild of a young producer, then still in his 20s, Ilya Salkin. But what, what does he have here? Well, there is going he persuaded his father, Alexander Salkin, and his co-producer, Pierre Spengler, that they should buy the film rights to the character. It was an enormous challenge. So I explained to him what it was. I said, Superman is a man who flies, who can do this, who is good, has terrible enemies, and all kind of fantastic things happen. And he, he immediately clicked. When Elia mentioned it, I started reading all the stuff about And... Uh, I believe it could be very good as a major film if it will be done right. With a story by Mario Puzo, the author of The Godfather, and Marlon Brando cast as Jorel, things began to take shape. Only one problem remained find an actor to play Superman. I, I thought it should be an unknown at the beginning. Now, they all started working on me, and the commercial side said, we need a star. After we had Puzo and the director, we need a star. So the movie really goes right to the top. And I, you know, I, there's a moment where you weaken, and I said, well, you might be right. So we started looking for stars. And uh, thank God, uh, Redford turned it down. Dozens of stars and hundreds of unknowns were tested, and none of them were right. They kept coming back to a young man they'd seen earlier in their search, Christopher Reeve. At first, they'd considered him too young and maybe even too skinny, but his mature calm made a continuing impact. I wore a big, bulky blue sweater because I thought, oh my God, I've got to look stronger, you know, and I knew I was skinny. I'd been sitting around, hadn't been exercising. I mean, I get out and play tennis and stuff, but I don't in any way do body stuff. So I got the biggest Shetland sweater I could find up in my attic and went to this audition with it and sat there sort of, you know, sort of trying to be, trying to look bigger, you know, and everything like that. And it was Ilya Salkine and Vic Donner, who were the directors. And all they did, they put a pair of glasses on me and they sort of looked at me and said, you know, it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And we talked about New York and blah, 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 and nothing in particular, and I left. He got the part. But the problem remained, he was too slim. A padded uniform was prepared for him. But Christopher Reeve was determined to build up his own physique for real. The point is that when I started, I was a string bean. And Superman's not a string bean, so... Already, on this diet, I eat four times a day. Uh, I, tell you, I tell you, I'm on a high a meat diet, a protein diet. Uh, vitamin pills, nothing like steroids or anything like that. But, um, I mean, I get to eat as much of as anything that I want, and it's, it's great, you know. The thing is that on this part particularly, you have to start from the outside and work in. You can, you can do all the interior work you want to do, and it's still it's not going to get you to Superman if you don't have the physical strength to go with it. The thing that happens is that the stronger I get, you know, and I'm still not all that strong, but I'm, I'm getting that. The stronger I get, the more it helps my mental attitude towards the part. What sets Superman apart is that he has the wisdom to use his power for good. He has all these powers, but he's got, he's got the kind of maturity, or he's got the innocence, really, to look at the world very, very simply. And that's what makes him so different. When he says, I'm here to fight for truth, justice, and the American way, you, everybody goes, <laughs> you know? But he's not kidding. While Superman was getting into shape, so was everything else. 
the two biggest studios in Britain, housing hundreds of skilled technicians, brought in from all over the world, sprung into action. They faced one of their greatest motion picture challenges ever. Artists had been working for months on drawings that tried to capture this fantastic tale. From the drawings, sets were built so camera angles could be plotted and lighting schemes planned. The actual sets were built by more than 350 construction workers. Most of the sets had to be life-size, employing materials and techniques never used before. In some cases, elaborate models had to be built and had to match perfectly with the life-size sets. All manners of film wizardry were used. Precise lenses with automatic zooms were created. Special camera cranes were built, enabling the model to be photographed from any angle. Camera movement, dramatic lighting, miniature explosions, and breakaway sets were all linked together to electronic consoles, giving it all push-button control from a single vantage point. The whole operation took place under the guiding hand of John Barry, the man who designed Star Wars. Well, Star Wars is much uh grittier sort of story this whereas uh superman is has a much more poetic element doesn't it? i mean there he is in a red cloak and a blue suit and red boots but, so it is already much more of a fantasy krypton was the key challenge artistically for the film in effect a new society with a unique environment had to be created the concept of a world of crystal was conceived to everyone's satisfaction Crystals are both natural and technological, with a special organic quality that suggests they could grow rather than be manufactured. This is the biggest film stage in the world, and over the next 10 weeks, about 100 people are going to turn it into uh, a magical part of the Arctic where Superman's fortress of solitude is. We're going to, where I'm standing now will be the sea a lot of pack ice. But soon, all the planning and building must end, and the actors take over. Then the pictures become flesh, and there's magic in the air. My friends, you know me to be neither rash nor impulsive. I'm not given to wild, unsupported statements. And I tell you that we must evacuate this planet immediately. Marlon Brando, for many, the greatest screen actor in the world. You know, I, when I first came on the picture and I heard how much money Marlon Brando was paid for it, I was really upset because I don't think it seemed like much more money than anybody is worth. But then working with him and seeing him on film, to me, he's underpaid. Everything has a price in the marketplace, and uh, so do cars, so do hula hoops, so do useless endeavors, and... Uh, uh, I don't suppose that actors are any different than rock bands that uh, inflate balloons from their ears, and that happens to catch on what people want to buy. Marlon Brando has an unpleasant duty on the planet Krypton. Before the unearthly faces of his fellow judges, he sentences three ruthless villains, Ursa, Non, and General Zod, to an eternal living death. Specific charges listed herein against these individuals, their acts of treason and ultimate aim of sedition. These are matters of undeniable fact. Although his speeches are quite short, Brando prefers not to memorize them, but to have them written on large cards called cue cards. It's the way he prefers to work. There's nothing more boring than a director who directs an actor to go to the door and stop and then turn around and say, Martha, goodbye. You know that's going to come. <laughs> so if you don't know what the words are, but you have a general idea of what they are, then you look at the cue card. It gives you the feeling as the viewer, hopefully, that the person is really searching for what he's going to say. That he doesn't know what he's going to say. As he is a director himself, Peter. Brando is anxious to know exactly what a shot will look and sound like. He put some rhythm behind it. Who the hell? Electronic. Goo goo. Good. Just like the very top. You'll be there. You'll be there to do it like that. Just, right. And on day you switch. Try it. Let's shoot one.
These are matters of undeniable fact. I ask you now to pronounce judgment on those accused, whose only expression is wanton violence and destruction, and on the woman, Ursa, whose perversions and unreasoning hatred of all mankind have finally threatened even the children of our planet. There are a lot of marvelous actors, and I think he's, it's more than an actor. He, he has become a legend, he has become a myth. It's true we do it with Marlon. I mean, he's a, leg a legend, he's a, I mean, a true live legend. And I'm very curious about people, and that's somebody that's, you know, I wouldn't ordinarily meet. They have received the fate they deserved. Some actors are intimidated by the Brando legend. Others, like old friend Trevor Howard, are reassured. Thank you for coming in. I Chance for life. Tried. That's no, where we turn, <laughs> folks. <Yeah. laughs> I just watch Mr. Brando, everybody. Eyes on Mr. Brando now. Brando himself indicated to the crew that film acting can be fun. You cannot ignore these facts. It's suicide. I always was always impressed with the smile that you got in the morning. The smile that you got in the morning with American crews was all too often in direct proportion to the salary you were getting. And it was two teeth for $200,000, 10 teeth for a million, and you're getting two million. <laughs> it was the full Flatbush Cemetery. So. Two. So we'd only get as far in this one. Four. In this one, we'd only get as far as, 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 as. Where's your sticker? Look at your shoes. <laughs> oh, you threw my hair was you? <laughs> yeah, but you did this. <laughs> Krypton is doomed in a finely planned blend of computerized electronics, ingenious breakaway sets, and a mixture of models and studio setups. The infant Superman is rocketed to an unknown planet, millions of light years away, Earth. Keep it going. Keep it going. Start the rise very slow now. Start the rise. Make you move, Marlon. Very slow. Slow. Jimmy. Feel it, Jake. Wait. Films, as you probably know, are never shot in sequence, because that would be too easy and logical. And films, we always do it the hard way. No, really, you just go where the weather and cost and convenience dictate. So from our base here in England, we, we went to New York to shoot scenes of Superman as an adult before we went to Canada to shoot scenes of him as a child. Why New York? Well, if you ask me, New York is the eighth wonder of the world. No, it's, it's, it's something special about it. It's got the kind of madness and craziness and life that sort of confuse Clark Kent, but at the same time provides the all-time great backdrop for Superman to do his stuff. A typical New York heat wave, record temperatures up to 106 degrees, a hot and sticky metropolis. 
The Daily Planet is being played by one of the city's major newspapers, the New York Daily News. Not a location you can keep secret for long. So for the first time, those fictional journalists, Clark Kent and Lois Lane, come face to face with some real ones. For Christopher Reeve, an exhilarating experience. A great deal of excitement because why, as actors, how come we don't, if we want to act, I mean, why don't we just, you know, put on costumes and, and, and do plays up in an attic someplace, you know, on a rainy day when no one's looking? No, we want to reach the public. There is the excitement when the public comes out to meet you. So I'd be stupid if I said I didn't enjoy that. Now the question is, uh, will it stay in control or get out of hand? And I, that, that's, that's, it's a question of degree. But in my first exposure to it, my first kind of, uh, um, relations with the press and stuff, there's the excitement of they want to listen to what I have to say, they're here to talk to me, my God. I mean, this is also part of being an actor, is that there's, you get a certain fulfillment out of that. People have been telling me I was going to be a star for 12 years now. It hasn't happened in that kind of big way, and I think I've formed my own character enough at this point that fame and money aren't going to change it that much. The advantages that come with Fame and money are nice and not to be sneezed at. So I'd like that. Money. I really like to be rich. Some interviewers have to take potluck in the streets. You know, All right, now that's how you prepared for Superman, but yeah. how the most difficult role is to prepare to be a reporter. No, right. No, <laughs> how I, did I, you I, prepare to be Clark Archie. Kent? Uh, also with great difficulty. No, I, I, prepare, I prepare by, first of all, I, I set out for myself in my own mind the difference between the two characters and then things that I wanted to use to establish that. And then I just Others like famous artist Superman Andy Warhol right managed to lure Superman into their homes. Is that a Superman fork? No, this was a spoon, as a matter of fact. Oh, it's a spoon. I made this in shop in seventh grade. You're kidding. In seventh yeah, grade? Yeah, I went to this private day school. You had to take really shop and woodworking great. and stuff like that. This is a spoon that comes in the Princeton Day School cafeteria, as a matter of fact. No, they can't have it back. I wish you'd go back to school and make me one. <laughs> The first scene to be shot in New York is in the lobby of the Daily Planet. Quite a contrast to the controlled atmosphere of a soundstage. Crowds are always a problem when shooting on location. All right, here we go. Please don't talk. Give us a break. Rock roll. Yeah, listen, I got to go really times. I'll see you later, okay? Okay. Bye tonight. Hi, Clark. How'd you enjoy your first night on the job? But when the television crews depart, Christopher Reeve has more time to refine his Clark Kent. I thought it was kind of natural. Yeah. Oh, Clark. Clark. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. No. I think the strongest choice, the best choice, is the one you make first, because it's an instinctive reaction to both characters. And you generally find that later on, everything else is pretty much complications. I found that I was overboard on Clark Kent. Um, we came back during the course of the filming on Clark Kent, we sort of eased him up a little bit because he was just a little too broad. The voice was a little too funny, he was bumping into too many doors, he was just a little bit too much out of control. And I substituted a kind of eagerness and sort of desire to please instead, so that half the time he bumps into the door, the next time he walks through it absolutely, you know, uh, smoothly, so that so they don't try to keep the audience off guard, not, not know what he's gonna do. Um, I had, it took me longer to get to know Superman. Between takes, Lois Lane finds New Yorkers not in the least shy. Sure. 20 minutes. What? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> hey, Rex Hi. Dick Donner, how are you? Good to see you, thank you. Director Dick Donner talks syndicated oh, columnist Rex Reed into playing a brief cameo role. Good. Listen, <laughs> it's simple. We got them coming out, confusion in the revolving door. They're starting away. She spots you. This is his first day on the Daily Planet. Le, 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 uh, Clark, uh, Kent. Clark Kent. So he's in awe of everybody. And she says, Rex, how are you? Did you see anything good? And whatever you want. Yeah, it was fantastic. I saw the omen. Well, no, whatever you want to say. Oh, oh, Rex, this is um. Clark Kent. Bye. Bye, Wait for me. 
uh, you see me going in a, in a revolving door, well, if anybody knows who it is, it'll be a miracle. Filming in New York isn't easy. After facing the press and the continuing hassle of the heat wave, Superman's cast and crew have to overcome yet another hurdle. On the night of July 13th, the blackout hits New York and shooting comes to an abrupt halt. That helicopter sequence alone took six months to shoot. It involved five film units working in two countries. I actually looked up for Lois Lane in New York, and then I caught her when I got back to London six months later. I hope you're not too disappointed to find that out. There were a lot of things that I didn't know when I started playing Superman, because I'd never really read the comics as a kid, and I had to do a lot of research. And one of the things that I found out is that Superman is a multi-million dollar international industry. They sell five million Superman comics in the States alone, and another seven million every month all over the world in translation. Well, how did all this begin? You probably read about it, but it began in 1933, when a kid who was only 17 named Jerry Siegel was just lying in bed in Cleveland, Ohio, as a matter of fact, and was just watching the clouds go by. And he had a, he had a vision, really, of a man flying up among the clouds. So next day, he calls up his friend Joe Schuster, and within a week, they'd come up with a real, honest-to-goodness American myth. Well, today, there's a whole army of writers and artists and engravers who've taken over for Siegel and Schuster, and they come up with new storylines for Superman. Now, we see we have radar. So what would happen if the rockets start appearing Russia would see it on their screens, the United States would see it on their screens, and they both would want it for themselves. It might be interesting if uh, maybe the United Nations would want to play a hand, right. maybe the United Nations. But I think it might be best for the sake of the story that the United States gets a hold of the rocket first. The initial widespread fame of Superman was due to World War II. Saul Harrison, president of DC Comics. There was a shortage of paper, and anything that could be printed was uh, just eaten up by the uh, boys in the trenches. They needed simple reading, and they got it from reading comic magazines. On the covers of the early magazines at that particular time, we had the Superman with the Red Cross and Superman fighting the Germans and the Japanese. Not only could Superman leap from building to building with ease, he could leap from one form of entertainment to another. His superhuman feats were vividly communicated by radio. Kent, Kent, where are you going? After Miss Lane, something's wrong at Dahlgren's. If it's the mask, well, there's not much time to stop him. So long. Hey, kid, weren't you hurry? Yeah, I got another front page scoop, Kent. Oh, thank heaven. The locker room's empty. Quickly now. Out of these clothes. It's Superman's turn now. Oh, someone's coming. The window. Out. And up. By now, the movie has moved to Alberta, Canada, chosen to represent the plains of Kansas. Ironically, they could not go to Kansas as the wheat crop at the time of shooting had already been harvested. It is here that the infant Superman's three-year journey came to an end on a remote field, to be discovered by Ma and Pa Kent. Pa Kent is played by Glenn Ford. They were going to put a wig on me for Superman, you know, a white sort of wig. And they put it on, and I looked. I thought I looked like a cross between Mark Twain and uh, Albert Schweitzer. But it was a wig. And Dick Donner looked at me. He said, no, Glenn, please, no. I said, yeah. He said, and I said, I bet I know what you're going to say. He said, yeah, you look like Glenn Ford with a wig on. <laughs> we could say he's the child of my cousin in North Dakota. And just now orphaned. <laughs> The child from Krypton loses no time in demonstrating his power. The Kents realize that this is no ordinary infant. As young Clark grows up, he too becomes aware of his supernatural powers. He uses his powers sparingly and wisely. But if pressed, why bother to take the train? By coincidence, the little girl watching him will one day be his colleague on the Daily Planet, Lois Lane. Hurry up, 
In a piece of nostalgic casting, Lois's parents are played by Kirk Allen and Noel Neal. These two actors played the first Superman and Lois Lane in the original 1937 version of Superman. Truthfully, Jeffrey, did you know that? That'll serve you properly. True. They can see they don't believe you. I know. With the cliffhangers. Yeah. Well, my favorite still was the hobbies with uh, hobbies in the canyon. And the Indians on our one side, and the heavies are on the other. The dam has been burst, and the arrows are coming down, and the water's coming down on him. And he's trapped in the middle. And he came back next week, and he was riding along the thing. It just started with, after Hoppy got out of the canyon. <laughs> <laughs> in the radio show, whenever, um, whenever he, ch he changed from Clark Kent to Superman, they changed the voice, you see. They, they barrel the voice now. In, in radio, you can do that because they put something up here. There's a no, you know. They they do it a little bit. They use little tricks. Well, we couldn't do that in the in in the pictures. And besides, I didn't have to say up, up and away. It was ridiculous. People could see that I'm taking off. You see, so there's no point in saying it. And likewise, uh, uh, there are a few phrases that he used in in uh, in radio. Uh, this looks like a job for Superman. Well, now you don't have to say that because you can indicate when you're going to change from Clark Kent to Superman by just looking around a little bit, you know, and ducking behind. Now everybody knows you're going to change. So that uh, Jimmy Olsen and myself, about all we ended up doing, you know, was being tied up, bound and gagged and waiting for the fuse to ignite and blow us to kingdom come. Uh, but in the uh, television series, we had a lot more dialogue, and I think you had more chance to, you know, explore the character and do more with it. Love what you see, love what you see. Ready, Miss Tismaka? Have you ever tried running in high heels? He probably has. On another location in Canada, we find the incompetent Miss Teschmacher trying to help Superman's arch enemy, Lex Luthor, hijack a nuclear missile. She's played by Valerie Perrine. I've never done anything this outrageously comical before. Well, look, <laughs> I mean, you know, the bracelets, the, uh, you know, the wig. Ned Beatty is Luthor's other less than competent hench person, Otis. Not the most cunning of missile hijackers either. I thought it may have worked, but all right. Come well, reloading. I'm one step above a moron. I have terribly good intentions, but I'm an awfully bad, bad guy. <laughs> Wait, makeup for the makeup. lips. Lipstick! Now, I, I want it to go ac across the mouth like this. Okay. Larry Hagman is enlisted in the U.S. Army here, to practice mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Down to here, down to here. Right. To here, here, down to here, okay. Now, now plant it on this side, right? Now, wait a minute, how do you do it? How's that? Is that okay? Is that, is, does it match from yesterday? Huh? Was that nice? Well, I suggest um, vigorous chest massage. If that doesn't work, mouth to mouth. Yes, sir. Sergeant, I wouldn't let a man of mine do anything I wouldn't be prepared to do. But, sir. All right, get on the radio. Get an ambulance. I'm going to let this hold the convoy up any more than I have to. Ms. Teschmacher bravely tries to stop the missile convoy by pretending to be the victim of a road accident. All right, now, out goes the bad air. In goes the good air. If you two want a bigger, that's just fine. Back in Pinewood Studios, the newsroom of the Daily Planet contains all the old familiar faces and some young familiar ones, like Mark McClure playing photographer Jimmy Olsen. It's a clean, well, it's a pretty clean day today. The Empire State Building, the Daily Planet's got a good view of that. And uh, just, it's all buildings, is all you can see. Superman, we've seen him, you know, buzz by here a couple times, you know? Somebody being mugged right now down there. Can you get a shot of it? But over here, Clark Kent. This is Clark Kent's desk, but nobody knows he's Superman. So, and Clark here, and then the chief, his office is right in there. It's got all the pane glasses. Jimmy Olsen doesn't even have a desk. Photos by James Olson, Lex Luthor. That guy, what a, you know, look at that. You see what it says? 
Lex Luthor was jailed yesterday for life plus 25 years. That's tough. That's tough. So he's gone for a while, I guess. Before Clark Kent came in the action, Jimmy was trying to scheme on Lois, but, uh, you know, financially he couldn't handle it. So he quit. And then Clark came in and took over. Ever since that, you know, wrote me right out of the script. <laughs> no, it's a good part. Olsen works under the knowing eyes of an actor who was an international star at the age of five, Jackie Cooper. Perry White is the editor of the Daily Planet, the news editor. And I think uh, this kind of a headline is typical of uh, Perry. Very dramatic, very large type. Uh, a story especially like this, uh, while it's terribly, terribly unusual to uh, the city of Metropolis, uh, if he could find any kind of a story, he'd love to give it this kind of dramatic headline, you know. Uh, uh. Lois Lane is played by Margot Kidder. She grew up in a little town called Yellowknife near the Arctic Circle. Although she may be more at home on the range than in the big city, when it comes to playing Lois Lane, she was determined to give it a very personal interpretation. My Lois Lane came, I suppose, physically from New York, emotionally, which is the way I tend to go about it, and in terms of the different parts that make up her brain and her psyche, I guess she came from me because uh, I had nothing else to go on. The, the ambition, the manic drive, all that stuff was just parts of me that I, that I put in. I mean, I, I think that every person, particularly actors, are made up of about 80 to 100 parts, and it's simply a matter when you take a role of choosing which parts of yourself could be usefully applied. <laughs> I guess she, she loves the, I mean, he's, you know, of course, the, the catch of the year, the biggest trout in the pond. <laughs> I mean, the wonderful, perfect human being. Mm. <clears throat> Is it true that you can see through anything? That's the stuff. Yes, I can, pretty much. Okay. See, I, I feel but like leaving her hung up there. Because no, 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 I, no, I, I have not. to just drift I'm on her face. Okay. But she's stealing the scene from you there. Right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. okay, here we go. Well, I gotta have a little dry. And there was one key scene for the whole part for me was the balcony scene with Lois, what I call the balcony scene. It's where he flies in and, um, and talks to her uh, on the balcony sort of about who he is. Uh, is it uh, true that, um, that you can see through anything? Uh, yes, yes I can, pretty much. And that you are totally impervious to pain? Well, so far. What? color underwear am I wearing? Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry I embarrassed you, didn't I? Oh, no, no, not at all, Miss Lane. It's just that you know, this platter must be made of lead. Uh, yes, so? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I should explain. I sort of have a problem uh, seeing through lead. Oh, that's very interesting. Mm. Uh, do you have a first name or anything? What do you mean, like Ralph or something? No, I mean like, uh... Pink. We changed the whole sort of tone of that scene uh, because I felt that it must be that, that the time had come when Superman would be open enough to, to say that he's there because he really likes her. K R Y. Do you like pink? I like pink very much, Lois. How fast do you fly, by the way? Why don't we fly down together? And how do you propose we do that? Well, you can take a ride with me. Ready? Clark said that you're just a figment of somebody's imagination, like Peter Pan. Clark, uh, who's that, your boyfriend? Clark? Oh, Clark. No, he's nothing. He's just a... Peter he's... Pan, huh? Uh-huh. Peter Pan flew with children, Lois, in a fairy tale.
62681. And continue. This is California. The richest, most populous state in the union. I don't need a geography lesson from you, Luther. Deep down under Grand Central Station, Superman to... learns Luthor's master plan to activate the San Andreas Fault with the hijacked missile. All right. The San Andreas Fault, maybe you've heard of it. Yes, it's the joining together of two land masses. The fault line is unstable and shifting, which is why you get earthquakes in California from time to time. Wonderful. Couldn't have said it better myself. Now, everything west of this line here is the richest, most expensive real estate in the world. San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Everything on this side of the line is just hundreds and hundreds of miles of worthless desert land, which just still happens to be brothers, but it is. <laughs> 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 All right, here we go. Does it really? Yeah. Uh, when I first heard about the project, I was, you know, everyone says, uh, yeah, well, hmm, you know, big snooze job. But uh, then the, when I, the part was, the role was offered to me and the script was sent to me, the uh, the character was uh, totally different than I had I had pictured it in terms of of I saw there was a great deal of latitude there that I could maybe have some fun with it to um, that there was some uh, it was written well enough so that there would be some uh, comedic value. Well, you can you can see by looking at this this suit that I have on. This is not my real clothes. I hope you understand. But it's uh, a certain style, a kind of a, a panache that the man, the character has. That uh, it's fun to play. I think he is that kind of character where he has uh, uh, great contradictions. You're a dreamer, Lex Luthor. A sick, demented dreamer. Your plan could. Gene Hackman has considerable respect not only for the way Reeve is tackling his dual role but his decision to risk being typecast as Superman. Which, by the way, happens to be target zero, which is right there. I think he's very good, and I think it's a, a wonderfully brave thing for him to do, to take on a role that, that has traditionally, this kind of role, has been uh, difficult to overcome in terms of one's career. Uh, I think he has the capability as an actor to, uh, to certainly survive the film whether it's successful or not it's not important i'm talking in terms of of being typed uh, I, I think he certainly has the capability of, of uh, coming out of the film in great shape if someone had come to me and said do you think that this guy should take this role i probably would have said no i don't think he should have but after getting into the film and seeing the kind of the production value and the kind of care uh, that's going into the film then i, I think i'd have to change my mind do you really think you could hide it from me by encasing it in lead? I'll mold this box into your prison bars. Don't touch that, please. <laughs> I told you not to touch it. Oh, uh... Hmm. That's kryptonite, Superman. A little, uh, souvenir from the old hometown. I've spared no expense to make you feel right at home. He's a lot of what America once was a long time ago. I'm a very liberal human being in my philosophies and my politics, and I find myself, in an odd sort of way, looking and respecting the conservative attitude of what Superman it stands for now. Because I think I see a lot of my philosophies in application now, and I'm not very happy with them, and I almost wish I could go back to what once was, and uh, what America once was. The chain, is the the chain. I remember there's a wire on your neck. Yeah. And don't touch those wires together, you'll be short circuited and they <laughs> you grow up in flames. Mind over muscle. You don't even care where the other missile's headed, do you? On the contrary, I know exactly where it's headed. Hackensack, New Jersey. I'm gonna leave you now. No hard feelings. We all have a little fault. Mine's in California. You know, we'd always worried during the production whether we'd succeeded in bringing Superman to life. Because making people believe that a man could fly wasn't really the hardest part of making the film. I mean, we all know that Superman can leap over tall buildings, but the question is, could he leap over the generation gap since those early Siegel and Schuster days? We wanted to know if a man from the innocent 30s could survive in the post-Watergate 70s. Well, thanks to all of you, he's doing just fine.
Now you can appreciate what it was like making a complex, challenging film like Superman. On behalf of all who made it, thank you for watching. <laughs>